All right, Rachel, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Um, I tell us a little bit about you, you know, that maybe we wouldn't have read in your bio or heard in your bio, like who you are, where do you live? What do you love to do? Something like that. Cool. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, well, first and foremost, they may not read that we know each other from uh, <laughs> doing uh, triathlons together and CrossFit, but um, former. Uh, and how I was thinking, like, how long ago did we meet? You were like living with Trish. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was Jacksonville days, which was 2013 to 16. Um, okay. We did. So Literally like 10 years ago then yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, when I just turning 30 is when we did when we were doing the triathlon <laughs> down in, yeah, we did a triathlon in Daytona beach. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you were the best like motivator, but, um, uh, I remember it was cold. The water was like, <laughs> very like cold. 70, like 69, 70 degrees. And the, and the waves is, were crazy. And the waves yeah. were crazy that day. Yes. Oh my gosh. The waves were really big. Mm -hmm. so crazy. But, yeah. um, I think they called it. I think they, I'm totally going off on a tangent. No, don't get I, think, I think like a couple heats win or mm -hmm. went and then didn't they call it? So not everybody swam. Right. Yeah. No, I only got to swim halfway and then they made us turn back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So right. I was part of that. Like I was in like going to the second buoy and they like made everyone like kind of go back like, in. Cause it got too choppy. Yeah. Oh man. Crazy. As fast as you were. Like, you were like probably already on the beach already. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. memories. And, um, yeah, so a little bit about me, I guess. Um, I am married. I have I'm a first-time mom. I have my own practice, which I never anticipated, but the pandemic um, kind of was the catalyst of me. Yeah embodying my entrepreneurial spirit <laughs> yes yes for many women I think yeah too, and right? so you know in that regard it was a hidden blessing because um I don't think I would have um been as eager to to make that happen as quickly as I did so yeah. I kind of surprised myself in that um you know in, in doing and in, in you know developing the practice uh, during that time um yeah. So, um, I love guys to cook. I, <laughs> um, and you love to dance. I'll I say that. Love to dance. I, I love to dance and, um, I wish, and you know, one thing that I was really surprised about is, you know, how much like, I got into CrossFit after you, uh, mm -hmm. you invited me one time and then I was like hooked. Right. For like five years, but then, and so I really love in high intensity workouts, but then yeah. after the baby, I realized, well, first of all, there's no way I could even try to do that. Mm -hmm. But then I became a Pilates mommy. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I've never done Pilates. I never would have thought I'm like, it's too slow. It's like, you're not even doing anything, you know, but it actually really helped my recovery. Oh, and, I got all that um, core work. Yeah. Auto forward, pelvic floor, even. And mm -hmm. yeah, it, I, I'm sold now. <laughs> yeah. I actually have a card for uh, a local Pilates gym here that I've been meaning to call her more for business, some business things too. Yeah. So uh. yeah, I, I, I really want to do a one on one because I'm part of like club Pilates right now, which, you know, and eh, it is what it is, but it has been, it's been really, really helpful. So that was something. Yeah very unexpected. So I think that the last couple of years, a lot of unexpected things I've gotten into that I didn't <laughs> anticipate. And then it's like, Oh, okay. I, I Life can... just brought it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh so. my gosh. So tell me about your practice and like the type of clients that you work with and like what you do break that down. Yeah. So, um, my background is I primarily did for like the first, like 13 to 17 years, I've done like nonprofit um, work. I always typically worked with um, kids in the foster care system. So originally I was a manager for kids and uh, for group home for kids in foster care. Mm -hmm. And I did that for about five years. And then I went back and got my master's degree. And during that, I did in-school counseling. I did, um, and then I worked for an agency that helped reunification cases. So kids that were removed from home and uh, reuniting with their parents, I either worked with the kids or the parents yeah. um, doing that. And so I, you know, over time evolved from being just primarily a child and like 
you know, either a child or a teenage therapist to doing child and family therapy Mm -hmm. and then with the pandemic and doing primarily, um, a lot of virtual sessions, you know, I'm very hands-on. I do a lot of play and art therapy techniques. So I kind of had a pivot with my, with my like, um, main clients, you know, my clientele. Um, so I, I started seeing more adults at that time. Mm -hmm. All of my work though, I I, is basically centered around childhood trauma recovery. So whether it is doing concurrent work, like there's recent childhood traumatic events, Mm -hmm. or I'm doing retroactive work of an adult going and walking through and recovering from trauma um, that they've experienced. So Mm -hmm. And my primary, uh, within my practice too, um, EMDR is my main modality of treatment um, because I've seen how much, um, how effective that is for, Mm -hmm. for therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, And what is, if somebody doesn't know what that is, can you you explain what that is? So everything therapy is too dang long. So we have acronyms for everything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but uh, EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So this um, was formulated back in the 70s. And basically it's, you know, Francine Shapiro noticed that if you move your eyes back and forth while um, thinking about a distressing event, the uh, trauma response goes down. And mm-hmm. basically the uh, science behind that is the bilateral stimulation work taxes the working memory and so when you do that it can allow you to decrease the emotional reactivity to the event Mm -hmm. so there's eye movement so there's ways that we do that as we do eye movement um bilateral side to side Mm -hmm. um, or diagonal um and then there's also bilateral tapping you can do um, self-administering tapping Uh um, tappers there's auditory so there's a lot of ways that you can effectuate the um, the method, it's just, um, it's just basically doing bilateral, but it's okay. tapping into the different sides of the brain. Mm-hmm. Interesting. It's so interesting. And that was, you know, part of the reason you and I were chatting before that I wanted to talk to you is, you know, obviously this podcast is about burnout, rising from burnout. Um, and you know, a lot of the data, you know, and, the like from a medical standpoint, I think the, the medical community is, is, um, more, what's the word? I, I just hear people talking about more the, and acknowledging that trauma has an effect on your physical health too. Mm-hmm. Um, where I feel like years past, maybe that wasn't a dre- you know, a factor that was addressed. People were, you know, dismissed and, and, and people just didn't talk about, you know, yeah. their, yeah. past and, and well, I think there's a lot of stigma um regarding mental health and you know trauma and I think that we're now starting to be able to quali- like allow people to qualify what trauma is instead of you know having you know in even in EMDR we call them like big T versus little T traumas and yeah I I the thing I tell my clients is I'm like whether you have a big T trauma which is like the faucet going full fledged that fills up the bucket or it's a little T trauma that's a drippy, leaky faucet, right? I'm mm-hmm. like, either way, the bucket gets filled up. Yeah. So it really doesn't matter. Like, and so right. I have a lot of clients who are like, oh, I, I, I on my website, I indicate that I'm trauma informed and that's the approach that I use. Um, and I have a lot, majority of my clients do seek me for trauma treatment and EMDR specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, but for clients who are like, I don't really think I've gone through trauma. Um, and I say, well, let's look through the lens of negative life events and impact and trauma sometimes is something that happens for too long. Mm -hmm. It's too intense. It's too intense for too long. Yeah. And, and so it's the nervous system. It's not necessarily even a mental Mm -hmm. like registering mentally that something is traumatic. Sometimes your body is just holding on to that. And so like you said, there is a lot more research that's being um, public, you know, made more public and accessible that trauma is stored in the body. Yeah, um, there is a book. It's like one of my favorite ones. <laughs> I keep it. <laughs> it's called "The Body Keeps the Score." Yeah, by, um, Dr. Vanderpluck, and he, you know, talks about that and how um, the 
there, you know, even if you don't have like visceral memory of it, or, you know, even if you don't have like your vivid memory of it, like you have a visceral response to Mm -hmm. something. Um, and, and so a lot of times, even I have clients who say, yeah, I'm thinking about the disturbing, I call it, even if I'm like, okay, you don't want to call it trauma. We don't have to call it trauma. Like, yeah, they get men or teenagers and they're like, I haven't been through trauma, you know, cause they're thinking it's war or something, you know, yeah. that w- and anybody could, um, agree. That's like, wow, that must've been really hard. Sometimes it's not that. And sometimes I say, well, sometimes trauma isn't just what happens to us. That shouldn't, that, that shouldn't have happened sometimes, or sometimes it's not just the things that happen that shouldn't have happened sometimes mm. it's the things that didn't happen but mm. shouldn't have happened. so yeah. with my trauma-informed approach I'm really like taking I take two to three sessions to kind of hit the highlights low lights of somebody's life when I'm first getting to know them like yeah. they might say I'm coming in here to address this situation and I say mm-hmm. I honor that and can we go back so I can understand the context of your life 15 before 14 years before now 30 years before now whatever right and so with that I'm kind of looking for mile markers and being like oh my goodness like this person didn't have a present parent you know they just they're like oh this is something I didn't you know think of or it was like they had a major it was was normal to them yeah it was it's sometimes sometimes the disturbing events the traumatic events the negative life events are so normal that people don't even recognize Mm -hmm. that it is traumatic for them um and so you know a lot of times um, that's just what I, so then that's what I walk through with clients. I, I don't try to make something be traumatic for someone, but I might be curious. I might say, okay, this event you told me about when, are there any triggers? Like, are there any current triggers? They're like, oh yeah. In my, you know, I'm fine with my, um, you know, my, my friends, my coworkers, everyone's fine. But then when I get in a relationship, I'm a mess or, you know, or Mm -hmm. it might be the opposite. It's like, I'm fine everywhere except for always get fights with my boss. And I'm like, this, that's a trauma reenactment with your parent, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. So so it's, it's by helping my clients kind of giving me that historical context, Mm -hmm. it allows me to give insight and perspective to this thing that they're saying that they want to address in the current. And I want to honor that, but a lot of times there's something historical that's actually yeah. predicating that, that response. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and could you, you know, you mentioned, I was gonna, actually going to ask that question because I had another friend on the podcast talking about that big T versus the little T trauma. Uh-huh. Do you mind giving some examples just so if people are like, cause I, I actually have a friend that I'm thinking of in particular, and I think she is aware of it now, yeah. but I think she wasn't aware for a long time that this mm-hmm you know, my, was a negative life event for her. You, yeah. Same thing. It was like, this is just how I was raised. Yeah. Well, I, I'm always cautious to do this personally because okay. I never want to qualify someone's trauma. For instance, mm-hmm. um, I don't, you know, okay. So if we think of war as being a yep. big trauma, it's like bombs going off, unstable housing, all of that. I would never want to minimize someone's impact. Like maybe they didn't experience war, but maybe they experienced homelessness or yeah. you know um you know they they didn't have stable housing hmm. maybe there's not the you know the intensity of the bomb going off but the the sense of safety you know no, yeah. no security or no stability is the same so I'm really reluctant to kind of qualify someone's trauma as far as like big t to like it yeah. is a dialogue that has happened but I personally don't try to do that because I let someone else do that. I let the client do that for me. Do that themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like I might say, okay, let's make a big list of all your like from everything you told me, let's make a list of all the negative life events. Mm-hmm. Now you tell me what's a big T or a little T. Like got it. Got yeah, it. You mm-hmm. like and for instance, like I might have somebody say, okay, I was bullied in sixth grade. Mm-hmm. That might be a little T trauma. But I might have somebody say, I was bullied all through high school. And that's a big T trauma for them. Mm-hmm. On the severity, the intensity, the frequency, right? Yeah, got so it. I would never want to say, oh, bullying is a little T because yeah, understood. had something really mm-hmm. severe happen. They're like, well, damn, like I don't, yeah. you know, I don't have, like, I guess that's not that big of a deal. I'm overreacting. And so got it. Got I, it. I can't have to do that, but I, I, I 
process of my clients qualifying that for them. Mm-hmm. I guess my question was more, um, yeah, because say, yeah, I would not want anybody. It's the same thing I talk about with my clients is when they were triggering that stress response, that fight or flight. It's the it's their perception of yeah. that being a stressful event. It yeah. couldn't. It could not even be. I know for me, I would trigger that response thinking about all potential negative outcomes that weren't even happening. And I triggered fight or flight response in myself, I guess. But my going back to the question I asked you, are there things that you see that people, um, maybe if somebody was listening to this and they had a negative life event that they maybe minimized and didn't, didn't, um, don't recognize that as impacting them. Yeah. So, is, yeah. That, is that something that you see? Yeah. 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 Actually. I mean, so I think divorce is a big one. Um, I mean, because it's so prevalent people, I think reduce the impact and just mm-hmm. because something is necessary doesn't mean it isn't, um, traumatic or isn't negative. Right. So having to move, having to have go to two homes, having to sleep in, you know, learn two sets of rules, like, you know, your whole like kind of life being uprooted and people are mm-hmm. like, oh, well, 56% of, you know, and, you know, more marriages end in divorce. So it's like kind of nonchalant. They're like all my friends' parents got divorced and mine yeah. did too, or you know, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Right? So it, that doesn't mean that it's a traumatic event for everyone, but I do think that if people start to reflect, I have a lot of people who have been surprised about when we start to uncover the impact of their divorce, the divorce that they're, they experienced from their parents. Like, it's like, wow, that is, that was something that impacted my worldview. Mm -hmm. Like my sense of attachment to other people. I work a lot. I do a lot of attachment work. And so when people realize like, oh, that really impacted my attachment and your attachment is how you integrate into the world. Your attachment style is how you connect with other people, your friends, your peers, your coworkers, your teachers, your bosses, your partners. Our attachment style um, with our partners often reflects the attachment we have with our parents. Mm. So when we don't realize why we keep having these um patterns in our, you know, romantic relationships, more specifically, it could be across the board, but most, you see it the most prevalent in romantic partnerships. It's like, when I start to explore the, you know, what they observe between their parents, you know, uh, dynamic, or what they experienced in their each dyadic relationship with their parents, and like, is there any trauma reenactments happening? It's like, a lot of times, you know, people start to see it for themselves at that point, you know? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I think that, yeah, cause yeah, well, so many people get, and I, I know so many people who've gotten divorced. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I could see that being, I think like another one that comes up is like either, um, like something that's actually super benign, but like, it might be like, uh, a, either not even necessarily single parent, but maybe like a parent that had to like a military parent or somebody who was gone, but it wasn't because they didn't care or didn't love them. Like, I think that's a lot of times that that people have the intellectual insight to say, oh, my parents did the best they could. They had to go off into the Iraq war or they had to go to to do this tour or, you know, they had to, you know, work midnight shift. Like one parent worked the midnight shift and one parent worked like this. So like, I never got to see them. Like it just intellectually, they can, they they intellectualize it. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's like, yes, and yes. And how did it impact you that? this parent had to do this you know and so that's like sometimes that's where it's like not what happened but what didn't happen right yeah yeah Yeah. wow wow uh I I just I find this so interesting because it then it's like you know how then explain so much of how we are you know (laughs) why we are the way we are then later yeah And, and, you know, to your point too, with that, you know, adrenal response, I think the adrenal response will tell, tells the story, like no matter how much you will say on a cognitive level, no, that doesn't bother me or I've forgiven that person, or I've, I've gotten over that, or I accept it or whatever variation of that. Um, the adrenal response of, you know, like fawning or freezing is going to tell you really how you really feel about it. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I was going to ask you about that. So what your, you know, when you say trauma response is, it is that, right. It's that eliciting fight or flight of like, Mm -hmm. okay, you know, So there's actually four adrenal responses and fight or flight are the main two Mm -hmm. um, because those are often, you know, if you think about it, that, you know, where that's coming from is the animal part of our brain. Mm -hmm. So the animal part of our brain, it like clicks on and it needs to either try to get out of the way of prey or you are, you are the, (laughs) you're the predator, right? Like in the the animal world, right? So, but in, for us, um, there's, you know, the, the fawn response, which is kind of going along with something, uh-huh. even if you don't want to, um, mm-hmm. like, you know, and, and so I do see this a lot with like my sexual abuse survivors. A lot of times my clients will say I wasn't sexually abused. They don't even say like assault or rape or anything like that, because they're like, I didn't say no, I went along with it. I, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and so they have a hard time conceptualizing that fawning is actually in a, you know, a trauma response and this like a way to kind of manage that moment. Wow. Um, freezing is another one where you mm-hmm. freeze. And, and so shutting down is a nut is the, you know, the fourth one and freezing is another way of the body, um, you know, protecting itself. Mm-hmm. A lot of association happens and stuff like that. And I think freeze is actually a lot associated with the burnout. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've never, I've heard people say fawn and freeze. I know just from, you know, by a lot like medical, you know, autonomic nervous system, fight or flight, but yeah. I've not ever heard somebody break down the fawn or freeze. Like you just did like more from a psychological standpoint. Yeah. So that is, that's interesting. I can definitely identify with going along with things yeah. that yeah. even maybe not, you know, but just, yeah. Well, I didn't want to do something, but I went along because, and that's where like somebody said, Oh, I'm a people pleaser. I like to make people happy. And they don't realize that that's actually, that's that fawn response. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, and so that's how I coped with a difficult situation. I just went along with it. I just say, yes, I just, you know, I was like, I don't want to go to this party. I don't want to do this event. I don't Mm want to whatever. And it's like, you know, whatever. And it doesn't even have to be as extreme as, you know, some type of assault, but it's like, it's more of like, the aftermath of sometimes feeling that pressure that you can't say no mm-hmm. that comes from like voice not being heard not feeling validated not feeling safe to show your emotions or feel your emotions or to express yourself not being yeah. taken seriously um and yeah so wow um, that's like I do a lot of parts work too um so typically when someone comes in my practice um I do my initial assessments with them to kind of identify like their their current symptomology and things like that. And I assess for like, you know, anxiety, depression, PTSD, ADHD, things like that. But during that history taking, I'm kind of like looking for those mile markers, like I said. Um, And I start to um, uncover some of what we call in like, it's called IFS. Again, everything has an acronym, which is internal family systems. And okay. um, Richard Schwartz made this up and so he basically said that like the whole theory of like somebody having multiple personalities he said like everyone has multiple personalities <laughs> to some degree um so basically we're either born with or these protectors develop as a result of dealing with um negative life events or and what we do is these events and emotions create an emotional exile mm-hmm. so like again, for somebody who might've been bullied, maybe in sixth grade, and then guess what? They go to a new school and avoid from being bullied. They become really gregarious and outgoing and all this kind of thing where before they were really shy and it's a big protector. And it's like, yeah, that's, it, it, that's actually not a negative, um, you know, way to cope, but what they're really protecting themselves from is that rejection and things yeah. like that. And I have had some clients who, um, that still works for them when they kind of make those connections. Then I have had some clients who are like, you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired of always being this person that people mm-hmm. expect. I'm tired of being pleasing everybody. I'm tired of being the life of the party. I'm yeah. tired of being the smart one, the funny one, the reliable one, like whatever it is, like whatever this manifestation yeah. of the detector came up. 
sometimes as we're doing this parts work, they're like, I'm tired. Like that part of me is tired. And it's like, well, do we need to retire that part? Do we need to like, Um, and usually what that means is that we're actually unburdening the individual from this wounded child. Cause usually this part is young. Usually it's like, you know, an L, you know, um, a younger part of ourselves, whether it's, you know, tr- you know, childhood or teenage years or even young adulthood. This is usually a younger part because when I start exploring this part, it's usually never the client's chronological age. Mm-hmm. And like, how old does this part of you feel? Um, they might say it feels old because it's been with them a long time. Wow. <laughs> If this part had, if we were like creating a movie book or play of your life, what, and this was a character, like what would he or she look like? And they usually always describe a child or a teenager. Wow. And, and so that's when, you know, that's actually that part that's stuck, that's in that emotional exile that's stuck. And, and so, you know, that's the part that we start to reparent as a result of that. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I just, I found this, find this stuff so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Like, I mean, I, I feel really like honored that people trust me enough to walk them through some of this stuff. Cause I'm like, you know, the stories you hear and yeah. the experiences that people have had, um, it, the resiliency that people demonstrate, you know, and it really just, it really puts things in perspective that everyone really has gone through something or is going through something, whether or not they identify it as traumatic or not, there's, you know, everyone's gone through something. I, you know, I always say everyone has a story. So. Yeah. Wow. I'm just taking notes uh, while you're, while you're talking even. Um, can you, so you were, you made a comment when we were talking about the fight, flight, fawn or freeze, Mm -hmm. you said the freeze part is where you think people then end up burning out. Can you touch on that and like, kind of explain what you mean by that? Yeah. I mean, I would think that adrenal responses in general, I think that if you have adrenal fatigue, I know, you know, all about like way more on the medical side than I understand about that. But I I think that that's really fascinating, but of understanding truly what's happening in the body, you know, that's beyond, like, you can't will yourself to be, have rest, you know, at that point, right. It's, it's like the damage is, is running its course, you know? And so I think the adrenal responses in general probably are huge catalyst to Mm. burnout, but for fun, for freezing, the, it's a big shutdown. Um, When you start to shut down, that's where a lot of people, I'm unmotivated. I can't get out of bed. Mm. I don't Mm. want to like things that I found joy in don't bring me joy anymore. Yeah. No, I think that it's like people have reached their, they're outside of their window of tolerance and in therapy, we talk about a window of tolerance. So we have a physical window of tolerance and you'll appreciate this. Like the thing about when you went to CrossFit, some days you felt like a baddie and you were like, I'm going to go for you. You'd be like, I'm going to lift 165 pounds over my head, <laughs> you know, or whatever. And then like, you could try to do that same thing the next day. And your body is like, Nope. Like, nope, can't right? do it today. Yeah. Yep. And so emotionally we're like that too, where Mm. in session, I don't, I don't ever put a agenda on what we need to cover or where we need to go, because Mm. I understand that maybe the reservoir, the energy reservoir that my client has that week, their window of tolerance might be smaller than it was the week before. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly assessing like, kind of where they're at, you know, and so that window of tolerance is going to be affected by those adrenal responses, whether it's the flight, flight, freeze, or fawning, Um, Mm -hmm. and so maybe last week, or for instance, we call it reprocessing with EMDR, so maybe last week, you know, and even if you're verbally processing, you're like, maybe last week I could have talked about, you know, my house burning down, or the breakup, or whatever it is for the 45 minutes. No, this week I actually can only do it for 10 minutes, you know, yeah. otherwise I'm going to shut down, which is that hypo arousal, mm-hmm. or I'm going to be hyper aroused, which is like the, the crying and all of that. And so like, um, and not that emotional, you know, 
crying or ex expelling the emotions is a bad thing. But um, I always say, client, like getting outside of your window of tolerance is not therapeutic for anyone. Mm -hmm. So the emotional flooding, which is a lot of times something only like maybe as an experienced therapist, you can actually observe, but it's something that the client is experiencing. So it's not just the crying that's like, oh, you're crying. That's, you know, you're outside your window. You kind of see them. They're like decompensating, you know, mm -hmm. and um, not able to. So that hyper arousal response, which is probably like the fight and the flight, you know, but the freezing and the fawning is more of the hypo arousal, which is the shutting down, the slowing down, um, the like it also could be like if I'm working with a kid or a teenager, I don't know, I don't know, this is dumb. Like, right? They start yeah. to start to shut down, like you know, the agitation. Um, when people start getting agitated about like through my questions or with mm -hmm. that, maybe like ten minutes ago, I could have asked them that same question and they were they could have answered it because they were in their window of tolerance then. But when somebody gets outside of that window, um, it's really really hard to do the work to, you know, that they need yeah. to heal and grow. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I could see that. Yeah. Um, I I'm curious, something you brought up about the free, when you were talking about the freeze, what I think of, you know, when I see people in that place is, you know, and we, and we are doing testing. So one of the tests I use is called a uh, Dutch, uh, plus is the one I use from precision analytical. And they also look at, um, uh, organic acids, which are like, and basically we can see that people's like dopamine levels are low a lot of times know. when they're in burnout, That's which good. makes sense that people have very low motivation or, mm -hmm. you know, in, in that. So like, like there, I always think it's, you know, just, just cool to be able to go, this is why you feel like I, a lot of my clients, when I explain their tests to them, they go, so I'm not crazy. I'm like, yeah. No. No, mm -hmm. you're not. This mm -hmm. is what's really going on in your body. I'm curious though, for you, you talked about assessing for, um, depression because I've had women that I've talked to, um, sometimes my clients or sometimes, you know, just I meet and they, I've had women tell me that like, like, especially if they've gone to like their primary care doctor, you know, their regular, mm -hmm. or maybe their OBGYN and they've told them, oh, you're just, you know, you're depressed here. Try an SSRI. But I've had women tell me, I don't feel depressed. Like this is different. How do you, and, and maybe the freezing and, you know, how would you differentiate if it's a, if it's freeze or maybe somebody has clinical depression? Well, people can have situational depression. And I think that that's mm -hmm. sometimes people hear depression and they might think I'm not bipolar. I'm not manic. I'm not, you know, I don't have episodes. And I think that understanding that there can be adjustment disorder, the adjustment disorder is like one of the least restrictive diagnoses, but like insurance will pay for it. Um, it's got like, it. It's like adjustment disorder with depression. So like if you've moved, if you got a new job, if you had, maybe you don't meet like postpartum depression criteria, but maybe there's some stuff going on. Maybe you recently had a baby. Like there could be a lot of like a death. Uh, yeah. A divorce. Uh, da, 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 happens yeah. within Six months you know, or so. And any change, maybe, you know, I think that a lot of people like when the pandemic first happened had adjustment with order with, with anxiety and depression, like that's yeah. a diagnosis. And it doesn't mean that somebody had like the like you were talking about the ser you know, serotonin is what is depleted a lot of times with depression, right? Because that's like the mood stabilization, um, feel good chemical, but like they might not actually have like the chemical imbalance depression, but mm -hmm. they might have situational depression. And I think yeah. kind of just normalizing, you know, that is, that's symptoms, okay. Like normalizing the symptoms. I think that people might say, I also work a lot. I have some clients who, because of their trauma or their life experience, they're actually high achievers. So somebody, mm -hmm. I, you know, might come in and like, I am like, you know, kicking butt at office. I am working out. I am doing this. And I'm like, okay. And then guess what? When the pandemic happened and they couldn't do those things anymore, they were like, mm -hmm. it kind of actually exposed their depression. Mm -hmm. It didn't create it. Yeah. But when they couldn't go work out five days a week, when they couldn't have the social interactions at work, when they couldn't fill the, like do what do whatever, right? Like when they couldn't go and eat out their fancy meals or even whatever, like do their 
you know, happy hours or whatever it was, it was like, oh, oh, wait. So like, I always say like, it's like kind of interesting that I think, you know, sometimes there can be situations that are the catalyst for symptoms. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there are situations that are happening that reveal Mm the symptoms. Yeah. Wow. I uh, had somebody recently tell me like, um, you know, people say the word triggered, 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 you know, that (laughs) triggered me, triggered. What is that? I hear that word all the time. Trigger warning, you know, Yeah, yeah, yeah. but she basically was saying, cause we were talking about shame and Mm -hmm. and like shame is already there. Mm -hmm. It's just the, you know, the situation triggering Mm -hmm. like, like a lot or just, you know, how like insecurities or things like that can pop up. And, and her take was basically that those things are already present, present in us and that they're triggered, you know, by X, Y, Z. And I was like, oh my gosh, I never even thought about it that way. You know, yeah, like if you think of like, like, a, like, a, you know, like, a, I think of like a board with all these buttons, right? Like when people talk about this word trigger, it's like almost like this electric board and connected if you push the button it is like happiness it is sadness it is shame it is whatever it's almost like when something happens and somebody says I'm triggered it's like boop, you just pop that like you just p- press that button and it activated that emotion like mm-hmm. yeah we're all capable of every emotion whether yeah. it's rage or joy like mm-hmm. we're all capable and everything in between you yeah. know it's just that there are certain situations that activate or quote unquote trigger Mm -hmm. that within us. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Oh man. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, um, so I'm curious on the, the, I talked to my clients. That's something, um, I have found really beneficial for me is you, you mentioned tapping, and I'm curious of uh, the tapping, you know, if, if what I know as tapping and just what, you know, and, and maybe speaking on like what exactly is going on. Like my understanding is that you're actually yeah moving, you kind of get that stuck energy or stuck emotions around things. And then like something like tapping helps to process through that. Yeah. It- so there's different, there's different methods. I mean, there is the somatic work of tapping mm-hmm. that just is like on certain pressure key points, like your clavicle or your temples, or even the sides of your hands. Um, mm-hmm. and like kind of almost doing like a positive mantra, like I'm safe, or I'm in control or something like that. Like it, it can kind of help like move that energy or reduce the, um, distress in that moment. Um, what we do in EMDR is a lot different and it's, we always, I always say like with the bilateral tapping, so like, it's actually like a butterfly tap to, if I'm doing, cause we're crossing the meridian. And so okay. like, um, like if we were doing like typical EMDR with the eye movement, mm-hmm. um, which is how it was originated, it would actually use almost like the DUI test, like follow with your eyes. <laughs> like, okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and what that, because it's trying to activate or simulate uh, like REM sleep, you know, we oh. sleep REM, we're moving our eyes back and forth to kind of process mm-hmm. the day. And, and, and so that's, that's how, that's like the science behind that is you're actually simulating that REM sleep eye movement. Oh. Um, yeah. And so I'm learning so much in this conversation. <laughs> um, and then, and then, yeah. So, but if you can't do that, you can still achieve the same because they realize, okay, well, what if somebody, you know, went to, cause originally people are like, I'm not doing EMDR. That's really like people who went to war or something, war veterans. And they did use that for that, but then mm-hmm. they said, they started translating it to, you know, other populations and realized how effective it was. Mm-hmm. And so I, th- there's like this infographic that I give my clients. Like a lot of people are like, oh, do you do CBT? Or, you know, they, they researched therapy before. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. CBT? And I'm like, yeah, I can, but like, you know, I mean, are you looking for something more traditional, like talk, you know, talk therapy or, you know, are you looking for a more non-traditional mm-hmm. and get more bang for your buck? Because we're, if you think about the brain and I show clients like a little big brain I have, I'm like, you're, when we, 
when we do traditional talk therapy, it's a mm -hmm. top to bottom approach, meaning that we're in the prefrontal cortex, we're, you know, all up here and which is great. That's where logic and reasoning are, mm -hmm. but you know, especially when I'm working with kiddos who that's not even fully developed. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, you know, and when you have a lot of trauma that, the, you know, there's a lot of brain development. People can have what's called developmental trauma. Meaning if you have childhood trauma, your brain is actually not developed the same way as somebody who has not had childhood trauma. So, so crazy. when you're trying to do all this talk therapy and people are like, I've been in talk therapy for years. And I just, yeah. And it has nothing to do with intellect. It has nothing to do with lack of trying or being committed to the process. It's yeah. recognize that trauma is stored at the lower part of your brain. So oh, wow. that, like we call so we say EMDR or things like it, like somatic work. Um, the other one, brain spotting is another big one. And okay. so, um, you know, when we, when we talk about those, those are a bottom top approach, meaning we are attacking where the trauma is stored at the lower part of the brain, the animal limbic part. And, and so we do get to cognitions. We do, do get to the intellect part. Um, but that's not where we can, we're, we're focusing more on like experience and where mm -hmm. that's cur still currently stored. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, and so even myself, like I never thought I was an anxious person. I was like, and you know, my personality, I'm very outgoing. I'm, you know, all this, but I never realized that my stomach, all my stomach issues, I had so many stomach issues and it uh -huh. was because like, I just was not in the place where I could even, I wasn't safe enough to acknowledge that I felt anxious. Oh, so it was like, no, I'm good. I'm showing good. up as yeah, stomach well, issues. Yeah. So then it was, but I have all the stomach issues. And even now there's even as self-aware as I am, I might, it still may not register to me that I'm feeling anxious, but my stomach, I'll, I'll feel it in my stomach. And then wow. I will, oh no, I'm anxious. I have to tell myself you're anxious right now. It's okay. Like, you know, so. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. I feel like that's something I've learned over the last year of just like the importance of to like getting in, like I hear people call it like getting into your body and like listening to your body. And it, I think it just, you just explained all the science behind what that, why to do that and what that looks like. So, and I think to, to normalize one, this isn't something that we're taught in school. This isn't mm. something, I mean, like my son will learn this just because of uh, he has a you know therapist as a mom but exactly like, yeah like family dinner discussions like get in your body you know like it, I mean maybe like hippies are like if you lived on the commune or something like like, yeah. like, back in the 70s, like they were very they were very much into what is your body feeling but somewhere it got lost in translation you know over the years you know and that kind of thing but I think if you're more into um you know eastern medicines or things like that like people are a little bit more aware of the mind body connection. Mm -hmm. And, and so, but I think Western nice like medicine and, and just so culture is very much like, you know, it's just different, you know, it's just very, very different. And so, um, you know, this isn't something that we're taught in schools. This isn't, all, you know, culturally something that we've really, um, have, I mean, I think we're getting more aware and we're incorporating it more, but it wasn't really standard care or standard practice or, you know, that, you know, culturally, um, we, you know, we abided by either. So the, the, um, the importance of being back in your body, I think that also when you're having an experience that's really scary, and you use, and the body will often use association as a way to cope with that. Mm -hmm. So if parents are yelling, you're in a car accident, you um, are experiencing some type of assault, you're, you know, whatever it is, like the body can only handle so much trauma. And so mm -hmm. the mind will dissociate to protect. And so that's why the body will kind of take the brunt of it, right? And the mm -hmm. mind has gone somewhere. <laughs> so the mind, a lot of people say, oh, I don't even remember that that happened, or I forgot that that happened, or whatever it is. Or I, you know, I remember the first part, but then I remember being in the hospital and that's it, or whatever, you know. And that's because the dissociation is such a huge protective measure. 
Mm -hmm. but the body has stored it and has kept a score of it. And, and so when you've been unsafe in your body and now we're all talking about go back in your body, people are like, no, no, I'm not doing that. Like, (laughs) I don't want to do that. Like, right. And so if someone's been, you know, victimized, you know, physically, sexually, or something like that, the last thing they want to do is go back in their body. So yeah. it's learning how to trust your body. You're learning the, a new relationship with your body, mm-hmm. you know? And I think about like the burnout and I think the bur- a burnout can also happen if we haven't, we're multidimensional beings, right? Like this mind, body, spirit, but if we're not kind of in alignment with each other, like those are in misalignment. Mm-hmm. I think that that can create burnout in and of itself. It's like, yeah. you know, your body's trying to tell your mind, no, you're not okay. Like your spirit's mm-hmm. trying to tell your emotions. Like, you know, there, there's all this communication that's happening. Yeah. Um, burnout is your body's communication tool. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Perfectly said. I, I, I agree 100%. It's interesting. Just when I started doing this work, it was more from like a physical standpoint and like, Oh, and you know, people are, women are tired. Let's help that. And what like was interesting is that over, you know, over time doing this, I was able to see not always, but often the clients I'm dealing with, even though they're coming to me for physical symptoms is why they're coming to me. Mm -hmm which I help them with, of course, you know, like there's things we can do to help those, but it's like, this is a psychological problem, Mm. you know, because they're, they're not all. And again, not always, but often I find, because I think maybe similar to some of your clients, my clients are high achieving women. Mm. And, and what I've seen, and, and I've even seen in my own life too, it's because of this, like, maybe need to perform, need to do it all. Like the people pleasing, the insecurities, you know, whatever maybe is that, is that root psychological causes like causing them to then physically burn out, um, Mm -hmm. which I just. Yeah. It's like, that's the root of it. And then like the manifestation is the, is the burnout. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The physical symptoms, you know, and I, you know, I've had clients who will come in because they have so many physical symptoms, you know, mm-hmm. and their doctor, they've gone to the doctor and the doctor's like, I think you go to see a therapist, you know, but a lot of it, like they get so many tests done, like fibromyalgia or, you know, all this kind of stuff where it's like, they don't, there's, it's not showing up. Mm-hmm. They might even have like, um, like Hashimoto's is that another one? Like autoimmune. Like, yeah. Thyroid disease. They might have some like so. autoimmune thing, but for a long time, the numbers are so close. Like, so they're not actually scoring for like hypo or hyperthyroidism or Mm -hmm. something like that. Like, and, but they're experiencing all these physical symptoms. Yeah. So the doctor's like, we'll just finally like recommend that they go to the, you know, therapist or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh man. I feel like we could go on and on and on, but um, (laughs) this has been such a, an interesting conversation and oh my gosh, you've just, I, like I said, I've learned a lot just talking to you. I actually didn't know. I've heard people talk about EMDR before, but I didn't really know what it was and the science behind it. So I'm like, Rachel, I need to schedule a session with you here. (laughs) I need to schedule a session with you. Uh, There we go. We can trade. We can trade. Uh, well, um, so tell us if somebody, you know, it, it hears you and, and wants to reach out and, and, and get help, like how do they connect with you? Yeah. Awesome. Kind of so stuff. if you are a Florida or California resident, you have to live in one of those states. Um, okay. I am licensed to provide therapy. Um, and I, you know, through to, I can, you know, see people in person, but I, um, my practice is hundred percent telehealth right now. Mm-hmm. In the future, I hope to go back to in person, but right now it's with telehealth. So, um, yeah. So, if the client is, or, you know, individual is either in Florida or in California. Um, you can look up my website, um, handcraftedcounseling.com. Mm-hmm. And, and we'll link that so they can just yeah, click and on so, it. Easy. Um, it is because I believe that each individual, just like how you go get a handcrafted cookie or cocktail, like I think your counseling needs to be handcrafted as well, that it's like yeah. not just you know, oh, I read this in a book or this is, you know, this and, you know, just kind of like blanket blanket. statement for everybody. Right. Um, So I take a lot of time. Sometimes 
I've had I, most clients appreciate it, but I have clients have had like a little bit of a frustration with my initial approach. Like, I just want to jump in. I'm like, that's not how you do any relationship. Like we're creating yeah. a system here of like getting to know each other. And, mm-hmm. you know, I usually say like a slow pace is the best pace. Like we can do this, like we're in it, like I'm committed. So let's yeah. just go at a pace that's safe. Right. But yeah. So, um, and my handle is, uh, the handcrafted counselor on Instagram. So awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. Go, go. And well, actually, let me say this. Then if somebody is not in Florida or California, mm-hmm. what maybe things should they search if they're looking for a therapist yeah. near them? Like the EMDR, so- you said somatic. Uh- yeah, somatic experiencing or like brain spotting. Those are more of what I recommend if you've been through, like if you want to, not that I, I'm not trying to devalue like, uh, you know, psychotherapy or anything like that as far as like CBT or DBT, but um, those are more skill-based. If you're talking about actually wanting to like see results, like heal from the trauma, see results, you know, mm-hmm. doing, you know, somebody who's um, more advanced in doing some like trauma work. Um, so honestly, like I'm on psychology today, you can go on psychology today. And it's just like you're, you know, doing, um, it's a more filtered search. So you can go like your area, if you wanted to do telehealth versus in person, what you're looking for, like, if you feel like you have anxiety, or if you feel like you have PTSD, you could put that in, or if you want to find somebody who specializes in those types of things. Mm -hmm. So psychology today is actually a pretty good resource. Mm -hmm. Um, also, if you have insurance, um, and that's for anyone, but if you have insurance, you could also go to places like Alma or Headway that have, like, they they do, they carry, they're for most providers, but they can connect you with somebody who is in network for you, too. Got it. So, Got it. Technology Today can do that, like, you can list, um, but that's also for people who don't have insurance, but um, mm-hmm. if you have insurance, there are, like, a thing called, uh, there's a um, entity called Alma, A-L-N-A, and they, I think it's helloalma.com is their website, um, okay. but they have, you know, clinicians who they've helped become in network with certain insurance carriers, and you Got could, it. if you have, like, United or whatever, you could, like, go and see and, like, connect with um, uh, and that's nationwide too. Mm-hmm. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. I didn't know about that. Okay. I'll have to put those in the show notes too, just there's so people other, can. There's other ones too, like, um, Alma, there's, Headway. There's, yeah, there's other ones like Zen or I'm going to, I don't know, but you could also like just Google, um, like insurance, provider, yeah. you know, thing. And like, there's ways to, to do that, but Mm-hmm. Um, well, and I would think if you just go kind of like well, on the medical yeah, doctor, doctor, like you can go to your, if you call up your insurance or look on oh, yeah. your so that's another site. Thing. Obviously you can mm-hmm. like go to your insurance website, mm-hmm. you know, again, type in, if you're Who's looking covered. for a network, you're provi- like, you know, you want in-person or telehealth or, you know, and they could give you a list of who's in network for you. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. This was right. awesome. This is so fun. And I like, I actually like want to like turn the mic around and ask you like a bajillion questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There we go. Well, I've actually been doing little, started doing little mini episodes. So I have like my guest interview like once a week. And then I do like a little like 10, 15 minute um, episode. I just started doing those like where I'd like teach on some kind of topic. So, so, cool. so yeah, cool. yeah. Amazing. That's amazing. Good for you. I'm so excited for you and happy for you. I'm proud of you. It's just awesome. I love Thank it. I love you. It. Um, Here, I'm going to stop this real quick. Yeah.